Tired out from a strenuous weekend? Get a little too much sunburn? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. You are stealthily stalking into a silent desert fortress, walking into what you know may be a trap. Around you stand a legion of dead men, and over you, an unseen menace hangs in the African night. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to Africa, to the Sahara, to an earlier day, in one of the greatest adventure mysteries of all time, Percival Christopher Wren's Beaugest. The report had been brought to my headquarters in Tokotiu three days before, and I'd had the squadron on horse and ready to leave within ten minutes. We've been on continuous forced march ever since. The camel scout had reported that the Zendunov outpost was under attack from a force of at least 2,000 Arabs, and that the tiny garrison had little chance of survival. As we came up to the last crest of sand dune, shutting off our view of the lonely mud fort, I ordered my sergeant major to dismount the men and form skirmish lines, while I rode on ahead to reconnoitre. Top of the ridge, I reined in my horse and sat staring in amazement. Over the 200 yards of bare sand stretching up to the walls of the fort, nothing moved. There was no sound, no sign of life. The oasis off to my left was deserted. The Arabs were gone, and the Dregolor of France still waved overhead. It was then two shots of welcome were fired from the fort and the bullets kicked up spats of dust off to one side of me. I rode in under the walls and stopped in front of the tall wooden gate. I could see now that every gun slit above me was manned by a grim-faced legionnaire holding his rifle leveled and ready. Congratulations, mes amis! Rose and I are proud to salute you! Come now! Why so grim? You are victorious! Inform your commandant that a major of the spies awaits his pleasure. Legionnaire! You up there with the pipe in your mouth. Go inform your commandant, do you hear me? Is everything in order, mon commandant? I'm not sure. Bugler, sound the regimental call. They do not answer, mon officier. Believe me, sergeant, when I get inside this fort... Look, mon capitaine, the man over the gate, he has been shot in the forehead. Suck! You're right, Sergeant. He's dead. And the one next wait, to him also. Wait. All along this wall. They are all dead. Impossible. Then who fired the shots when I rode up? Sergeant, get a volunteer. Have him climb up the wall and open this gate from the inside. If you will pardon me, Mon Commandant. Yes? I will volunteer. Huh? Oh. All right, Bugler, go ahead. Oui, Mon Commandant. Sergeant, this could be a trap. Have the men take open order at 50 yards and wait. And watch the gun slits there along the wall. And wait we did. Five minutes, ten. The men began to look at one another and to stir uneasily. The fort was silent. Nothing moved. Fifteen minutes passed. The gate was not opened. And the bugler did not come back. Finally, my sergeant and I climbed the wall ourselves, and we searched the eerie outpost room by room. But we could find no sign of our bugler, nor of any other living soul. The bodies of the entire garrison were on the battle ramp at the top of the wall. Their heads and shoulders jammed grotesquely into the gun slates where someone had brought them, while their dead hands clutched the rifles they would never fire again. Only two bodies were not so placed. One was that of a light-haired young man who lay peacefully on his back, his hands crossed over the rifle wound in his chest. 
and the other body. This one was the commandant. See, he was a gold star. So he does, Sergeant. But he also has a French bayonet in his heart. He was murdered by one of his own men. Uh, rifles fired from an empty ford. The bugler has disappeared. I do not like this place. How in the name of heaven did they stab him? His revolver is still in his right hand. And in the other, a scrap of paper. Perhaps the paper explains all of this, eh? Perhaps. To the High Commissioner of Scotland Yard, I hereby confess fully and freely that I and I alone stole the great sapphire known as Blue Water. Signed, Beaugest. What's this all about? What does this mean? Mon commandant, these things are impossible, but they have happened. They do not make sense. Uh, why do we not go outside? Well, this was not to be the end of it. Shortly after dark, a tongue of flame flared suddenly in the heart of the silent fort. And in a matter of moments, the whole interior was ablaze, throwing a great pillar of fire up into the black desert night. <laughs> We sat and watched it burn. There was nothing else to do. And as I stared at the leaping flames, kindled by some unseen and unknown hand, I realized suddenly that neither I nor any man alive would ever know what strange things had really happened here at the lonely fort of Zinterneuf. <laughs> My name is John Gest, and I am the only person alive who knows all that happened at Zindernoff. My two brothers and I grew up at Brandon Abbey, south of London. Bo was the oldest, then Digby, and finally myself, two years younger. I can remember very little of those days as I look back, except that we were happy, as only young boys can be. We read thrilling tales of the French Foreign Legion, sailed toy boats on the pond, and gave flaming Viking funerals for the tin soldiers who fell in our battles, burning them on funeral pyres of kindling wood with toy dogs and horses at their feet, while Digby blew taps on his trumpet. Our only queen was cool and lovely Aunt Patricia, with whom we lived. Her husband, Sir Hector, was seldom in England, and if the hurt in Aunt Patricia's eyes grew deeper with the years, why the great estate fell slowly into ruin, then we children knew nothing of it. There were the two girls, of course, our cousins. Only girls didn't count at that age. But those days are far away now and gone forever. And I can remember clearly only that one last night when the three of us came home from Oxford. Our cousins were there and we were all together for the holidays. It was on that night the story of Zindernoff rarely began. We'd finished dinner and played games for a while. Now we just sat in the library talking. Gradually, our attention became focused more and more on the small black satin box standing in the center of the table. Oh, please, Aunt Patricia, can't we open the case now and look at it? You've had it sitting there for half an hour. Oh, well, Claudia, dear. I thought you always liked to draw out the suspense as long as possible. <laughs> well, it's been long enough. Oh, I must say I agree with her, Aunt Patricia. Why, Bo, you do. I'm afraid so. Come on, let's have our semi-annual look at the family jewels, shall we? <laughs> oh, well, all right, then. I should have my trumpet and blow a fanfare. <laughs> right. There we are. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the six largest and most perfect sapphires in the world... The blue water. Oh, oh it's beautiful. beautiful. Rather, and I've seen it half a dozen times a year all my life. Go ahead, Claudia. Pick it up. Oh, no. It's nice to look at, Bo, but when you touch it, it always feels cold. What about you, John? Oh, yeah. Would you like to juggle a stone worth 50,000 pounds? I think I'll just look for a while, Dig. After all, I... The lights? Oh, what's happened to the oh, lights? Oh, it must be a fuse. Burden will have them back on again in a minute. Please, don't move about and bump into things. I'm, I'm quite sure everything will be all right in a moment. It's sort of ghosty. Makes you think of skeleton hands and cobwebs. Oh, oh, don't be afraid, <laughs> Claudia. You're among friends, you know. Oh, I could swear I felt something touch me. I can't understand why Burden did... Oh, oh there we are. Oh, not a soul got lost in the dark. We're probably Aunt all Patricia, a lot of... look. Please, ladies and gentlemen, and I think all of us are... 
Who decided to play this joke? The sapphire's gone. The next hour became a nightmare. None of us present would admit having taken the sapphire. And if the thing had been done as a joke, then already it had been carried too far. Aunt Patricia went to bed finally, telling us that the library would be left open all night so the prankster, which we're not using the word thief, could return the blue water to its case in secret. The rest of us drifted off to our rooms. And an hour before midnight, Digby came in to tell me quietly that our brother Bo had packed a bag and left Brandon Abbas. I turned out my light and sat in the darkness, listening to the ticking of the clock. I was not surprised when two hours after midnight, I heard a sound below my window and looked out to see Digby slipping off down the drive. I was fairly certain that neither of my brothers had stolen the sapphire, but I understood what they were doing. Gallant as always, Bo had run away to draw suspicion from those innocent ones who might be hurt, and Digby had followed in order to split up the search for Bo. I could only guess where they'd gone, but long before dawn, I decided where I must go and what I had to do. And so it was that five days later, I walked into the Fort Therese, into the recruit barracks of the French Foreign Legion in Algeria. And if they refer to this cattle barn as a barracks, heaven knows what hey, the output... Digby, look who just came in the door. Good Lord, Bo. It's John. Hey, John. Hey, youngster, come here. Digby. Oh. Hello. Oh, I'd have wagered ten to one I'd find you in the Legion. <laughs> you brainless young idiot. Both of you. <laughs> Why? What's wrong, Bo? Oh, Bo wanted to be the only noble one in the family, John. Pay no attention to him. <laughs> well, there was no need for all of us running away. After all, I stole the blue water. Don't really say how you could have, Bo, since I brought it with me. I had a deuce of a time getting it through customs. Oh, you oh, did, did you? Oh, now, look, you two. I've had that sapphire all the time. And if either of you would like to take a look at it... I wonder who did steal it. What's the difference? It's driven all three of us into the Foreign Legion now. And we're in for five years, whether we like it or not. Fine. What do we do? Well, we haven't done anything yet. It's supposed to be some kind of an inspection any minute. You know, you shouldn't have come, either of you. But, well, I'm, I'm glad you're both here. Thanks, Bo. So am I. I can't say exactly what we're in for, lads, but we're in it together. Oh, Lord. Oh, I think we're supposed to stand up. What is it, a man or a gorilla? I think it's Sergeant Lejeune. The other men say he's a killer. Gentlemen, my dirty little dogs. <laughs> Three sniveling little purse snatchers, if I ever saw one. Oh, I say now. Shut up! One more remark, and I will be most happy to kick your teeth out of your head. Put out your hands. All three of you. Palms up! Hmm. Never done a day's work in your lives. Well, we are going to change all that, my little pigs. <laughs> Sacre bleu, if we are not going to change it, I shall march you through the sand until you drop on your faces. When that happens, I shall kick you until you get up or die. If you choose to die, perhaps I shall go on kicking you after you are dead. You are in the Legion now, my little dogs, and I shall give you cause to know it. You will curse Sergeant Lejeune 10,000 times if you live long enough. And each time, you will wish you had stayed in England to be hanged, as you no doubt properly should. Is all of that perfectly clear? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. Ah, well, that is much better. Recruits, report in full kit to the parade ground in ten minutes. Meanwhile, fall out and clean up this pigsty. Yes, miss. Oh. If anybody want him, I'll sell my shirt. Are we in for five years of that? He's not even human. Well, he's part of the Legion, lads, and after all, they didn't ask us to come over here and join, did they? If you will pardon me, gentlemen, yes. I would like to take the liberty of introducing myself. Francisco Blondin at your service. Well, uh, we're the Smith brothers, Monsieur Blondin. Bo there, John, and I'm Digby. Digby. Uh, this is my third enlistment with the Legion, so I know what I am saying. And I can tell you, mes enfants, you have started off on the wrong foot. You should not have antagonized him. Well, how did we antagonize the good sergeant, Monsieur Blondin? Well, who knows? Perhaps your hands were too clean, but uh, no matter. For now, you have Francisco Blondin as your advisor. 
we are honored. I stand here very well with Sergeant Lerger. There are reasons. And I have other contacts, too. I know all the ins and outs of this business, and I can be most useful to anyone who has something very valuable to hide. These men here, they are all thieves, of course. Oh, good heavens, not really. Ah, there is no time to talk now. But after drill, we will meet in the canteen for a bottle of wine, and I think we shall become very good friends. Au revoir, mes amis. Au revoir. Well, chaps, I can't quite see Mr. Oily as one of our close friends. He overheard us talking about the sapphire, of course. Yeah, between him and Sergeant Lejeune. Hey, uh, signore, pay no attention to me. Pretend I'm only polishing this boot, eh? But listen carefully. Yes? Do not trust that man Blondin. He's a thief, a liar. He's a little bloodhound who works for Sergeant Lejeune. When you wish to know something, you come to me. Juan Tayo, I will take a good care of you, eh? I'll bet you would at that. Soon we find the chance to talk. I, Juan Tayo, will fix everything. Do not let anyone steal it, huh? I go now. You be very careful. <laughs> well, along with Lejeune, we now have a bunch of thieves who probably try to steal the sapphire. <laughs> Jorge, come along, lads. Let's find out how they march in the Legion. <laughs> March we did, hours in the glaring sun and the dust, day after day, and we wondered how much worse it would be on the desert. We grew hard and tough, and we learned the ways of the Legion, and the ways of the Legionnaires. Some we liked, and some we hated, but either way we learned to live with them, talk with them, drink with them. We became soldiers, Legionnaires. We longed for active duty, and we got it, even sooner than we hoped. We marched out of Sidi Belabes to the south, and we learned how beastly cruel the desert is. The kafar broke out the second week. That madness that comes when the brain is cooked by the sun. And men became gibbering idiots and died. At Togur, some of the men were detached and sent to Tokotu for cavalry training. Among them, my brother Digby, and the rest of us marched on. Two days later, our commandant went mad and shot himself, and the detachment's command passed to Sergeant Lejeune. On southward, we marched to the last southern outpost, straight into the mouth of hell, the fort at Sindenoff. If we'd hoped for action, we didn't find it at Sindenoff. Day after day went by with no sight of the Arab forces. Nothing but eternal sentry duty. And each dull day was like the one before. In full command now, Lejeune became more brutal than ever. And the men glowered and growled under their breath and whispered together in small groups. In a month, the fort was seething under the surface with madness, hate, and even worse. Off duty for the moment, Bo and I were sitting at the oasis and talking one afternoon. But we heard someone coming toward us across the sand. Uh-oh. Hold on to your watch, Johnny. Here comes that little weasel Guantayo. Buona sera, signore. You haven't seen no one around, huh? Not a soul, my little puppy. Goodbye. No, 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 no. I must talk with you. You should know what is going to happen. It must be good. It couldn't be any worse. You, of course, know the legionnaire named Schwartz, the one who was once a butcher? I know him. What about him? Perhaps he's going to become a butcher again very soon, signore. Perhaps he's going to kill a pig. There are no pigs here. Oh, but there is one, a great a fat pig, a real commandante of a pig. Le jeune. I did not say that. Mutiny, huh? It may take a lot of butchers to kill that pig. There are a lot of butchers, but for you too, the question is whether to be a pigs or butchers, huh? We shouldn't like to be butchered, of course, but... Neither would we like to be eaten by the pig. It's uh, very difficult, but you must decide. It will happen soon. Suppose the butchers did kill the pig and started across the desert. They'd be dead in three days, of thirst or from the Arabs. Uh, one must take a chance. Besides, this La Jeune, he plans to kill you for the great jewel which you have. I heard him tell Blondin. I see. Well, we let you know, Guantayo. Mm, uh, decide quickly if you wish to live. I must go now. Say nothing to anyone. Bo? Hmm? Rather think we're going to die, one way or another. Glad Digby's out of it. So am I. Well, <laughs> we'll wait and see what happens, shall we? 
But we were not forced to wait any longer than that same night. I was awakened an hour before dawn by someone whispering in my ear. It was Lejeune, and he held a pistol in his hand. If you make one sound, I shall blow your brains out. Follow me. I followed him quietly out of the barrack room with its rows of sleeping men, and we stood beside the oil lamp that burned in the caserne. I've been informed of a plot to mutiny, and I've been told that you and your brother have not joined it. I'm going to nip that little scheme in the bud. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Eh bien. You will go back in there and wake your brother while I keep you covered from the door. I have two rifles here. Your brother will take one of them and kill any man who tries to leave his bed. You will take the other and come with me. We are going to disarm the guard. Whatever you say, mon commandant. Va bien. Come on. We left Beau and guard at the barrack room door and made our way through the sleeping fort, up the ladder to the battle ramp. Everything is very quiet up here, mon commandant. I have just ordered the sentry into the guardhouse, and the arsenal is locked. Eh bien, bien. Go down to the guardhouse and take their guns. Tell them two rifles are covering the door, and any man who steps into the light will be shot. Oui, mon commandant. Portez-vous bien. We stood there on the ramp, our rifles aimed at the square of light in the doorway, and we waited. I watched the first gray light of dawn filter over the walls, and wondered if Lejeune was going to get away with it. I was given no chance to find out. Lejeune, look! Outside the fort! Arabs! Thousands! Sacre nom du cochon! We are under attack. Blondin! Turn out the guard! Open the arsenal and pass out the gun! Bugler! Sound us all! Look at the little pigs out there, Sacre Blue, but they'll find before they're done. It's Lejeune they're fighting! Come on, soldier! Fire that gun! The men streamed up the ladders onto the ramp, loading their rifles as they ran. They were soldiers, first and last, legionnaires. And in the face of battle, all thoughts of the mutiny were swept aside. Through the whole of that long, hot day, we fought the Arab mob, met their fierce charges, reloaded smoking guns, and fought them off again. All through the night, the snipers crept in close and poured deadly fire into the gun slits. And slowly but surely, a tiny garrison melted away. The Jeune was everywhere, cursing and firing his pistol, grabbing bodies as they fell and jamming them back into the ramparts so the Arabs could have no way of knowing how few we were. As the ghastly night drew to a close, only four of us were left, Beau and I, Le Jeune and Blantin, and before dawn, Blantin was gone. And then, as the first red rays of the sun swept over the sand... Oh! Uh, Bo! Oh. Bo! Never mind, soldier. Get below and bring up a pail of soup. The devil seemed to be letting up for the moment. But my brother, perhaps he's only wounded. I said get below. I'll take care of him. I propped my rifle against the wall and went down the ladder. At the bottom, I stopped suddenly. Le Jeune would take care of him. He was not going to take care of Bo the way he did the others by making a grotesque dummy out of his dead body. I climbed back up to the ramp. Lejeune was bending over Beau's body. He torn open his tunic and was pouring over some papers he'd taken from it. Huh? I, I thought I sent you below. You beastly thief! Take your filthy Stop hands off! Stop where you are! There is no reason why I should not shoot you. You have disobeyed orders. You... I have no need of you now. I sent off a runner when I heard of the mutiny. There should be a relief force here in an hour or two. <laughs> Perhaps two or three bullets in the stomach would be... Johnny! Uh, I've got his ankle, Johnny! Take him! I punched forward with him, I bayonet out of its scabbard, and I drove it into his house! <gasps> nice work, Johnny. I'm glad I could help. Oh, Bo, then you're all right you weren't dead. That's what you think, youngster. Deliver those letters. Be sure... Confessions made. Probably. Be sure. Be sure. Bo! I gathered up the letters, closed his eyes, crossed his hands over his chest. There's nothing else to do. Then I filled a knapsack with bread, water, and ammunition, prepared to slip out of the dead fort. At that moment, an officer in the relief force rode over the ridge to the north. I wasn't sure whether the Arabs were still in ambush, 
So I fired two shots to warn him. Then slid over the wall on the far side and sprinted for the nearest sand dune, a hundred yards away. I must have dropped there and fallen asleep immediately. When I woke up, it was dark, and the moon was just rising behind the black walls of the fort. And even as I watched it, a tongue of flame shot up, and in a moment, the whole interior of the fort was ablaze. But why? Why was the relief force burning Sindonov? Just then, the figure of a man slid over the wall nearest me and came running in my direction. I raised my rifle. Halt, you're covered! Huh? Oh. Well, hello, old boy. I, I thought you'd be out here somewhere. Digby, how did you get here? I was bugler with the relief force, Johnny. They sent me to open the gate. I hid instead. Things are pretty rough. Huh? Fairly so. Digby, they killed Bo. Yes, sir. I know. I, I saw him. Did you start the fire? Bo always wanted a Viking funeral. I had to give it to him, you know. Yes, I remember. I, I piled all the furniture together and I covered it with sheets, poured lamp oil around. It was the best I could do. He'd have liked it, Digby. I didn't have a horse or a spear, but I did find a dog to burn at his feet. A dog? Yes, Johnny. A dirty, rotten dog I found on the battle ramp. It used to call itself Le Jeune. What came afterwards, how we fled southward for many weary miles across the desert, fought bandits, starved and thirsted, all those things matter very little now. It suffices to say that the day did come when I sat once again in the great library at Brandon Evers, in the same room where it all began on that other night, long before. And I told the story to Aunt Patricia. How oh, it was all so completely horrible and so useless, John. Why did Bo steal the sapphire? Why did he have to do such a thing? I couldn't say, Aunt Patricia. So useless. I, I have a letter here that he left for you. I, I haven't opened it, of course. Please do so at once, John. Very well. Read it to me. He says, My beloved Aunt Patricia, if I may still call you that. Oh, Bo. When you read this, I should be dead. I took the blue water, of course, or rather the imitation which you had made after you sold the real stone. Oh, yes, Aunt. I knew about that. You wanted the money for the tenants on the estate. I approve. But I also knew how much you feared Sir Hector would find out. I thought that stealing it might help you. If I was wrong, I only hope that you may forgive me. Dearest Bo. For my part, I remain affectionately as always. Your own, Bo Jest. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and tonight brought you Beau Geste by P.C. Wren, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, featuring Barry Kroger, Wilms Herbert, Jay Novello, and Ben Wright, with Ramsey Hill, Lillian Bayef, and Peggy Weber. Music was conceived by Lucian Marowak and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. <laughs> Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.